Perfect. We did it. That's the episode. Done? We're done? We're done. This podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners and viewers like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And to stay updated with video releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. I'm Rani Shatar. This is the Beirut Banyan. Beirut is a small place, and uh, it, perhaps it's too small at times. I'm recording an episode with you this evening, and I think it was just two hours ago. I ran into you at Urbanista, and just a couple of days ago. <laughs> just a couple of days ago, and but before that, Hussein Laishi was coming out of Urbanista, and he warned me, "There's someone inside waiting for you." <laughs> for what? Maybe a week ago or two weeks ago, I was sitting with Monica Borgman, talking about her foundation, the Lukman Slim Foundation. And I wasn't done with the night, and I just wanted to, uh, I don't know, I wanted to maybe wander about a bit in Badaro, and then I see you showing up with the same exact mission. You want to wander a bit before going home. And so we wander the streets of Badaro, and I enjoyed that conversation. I think that's why we're here. Prior to that, maybe a month or two, my mind is off. I think we both found ourselves by accident in a very random. interesting, yeah. <laughs> your, your word is better, random, <laughs> uh, journalism related, but not journalism, more like analysis, at a dinner at Albergo with common friends. And that was the first time we met. But before we even met, just sort of, I saw you and I noticed that you sort of turned and, and saw me. We know each other. The city is small, and I know you from. Well, I know you from the news. I know you from Serde, and I also know you from politics and activism, and Mintishin in particular. And I find it quite curious that every time we meet, it's political. Whether it's Monica Bergman and Lukman Slim, or maybe a meeting that you're having that evening. Uh, whether it's Mintishrin showing me that you're an urbanista, <laughs> or even for that matter, common friends. Most of them are journalists and analysts. Samir Asir Foundation, uh, The Atlantic Magazine, The National, Now Lebanon, and we're there together. So all of this is politics. So I'm looking forward to having a very non-political occasion with you. And uh, I don't think this is ever going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably very hard. It's impossible. Yeah. <laughs> but this is a treat for me. And the reason I say that is uh, I'm a fan of what you're doing, your, your wider work, and also I'm a fan of Mintishreen. And the reason I say that is I can do that give and take with everyone in Mintishreen, and there's no, there's no red line. You can discuss about pretty much everything when it comes to Lebanon, and I love that. It's healthy discussions with many members of Mintishneem. And uh, it's an honor for me to speak with you. So that said, I, I, it's a long-winded introduction. Uh, I'd like you to share a bit about your background, what brought you to politics to begin with, and perhaps before we get into the deep analysis of what's happening, your passion to stay in Beirut, because that echoed with me after I saw you in Badaro. Uh, that was our conversation, whether or not to consider the departure. And we both said it at the same time, that's impossible. So why is that impossible for you and your own story? Uh, first of all, thank you so much for bringing me into this amazing table with this amazing discussion. 
uh, for real, uh, what the introduction you said, first of all, this is my first prolonged interview in English, so that's right. That's that interesting. Arabic. Yes, that's so true. that's going to be interesting. I'm testing my uh, foreign language capabilities since I haven't used the language for a while. You're probably more eloquent than me in English, so <laughs> for me it's a treat. <laughs> so uh, it's very interesting that what you said is that whenever we meet, there's something political about it. Like even the day I was in Badaru, I was having uh, dinner with uh, Khudur Aidu, the activist who was, uh, uh, who was summoned over what happened in Tarah Mirabi's house and in front of Mikari's house. So that was after he was out of prison, if I may say. Right. So we've had kind of a gathering in Badaru just to, to check up on him and to have a conversation about what happened with him during those three nights. That's your evening out in That Badaru. was my evening out in Badaru. <laughs> I left that place and I stood in front of the restaurant after everyone has left and I was like I don't feel like going home yeah. like there's more to the night and that's the first time we've had this prolonged conversation yes. yeah. uh, in terms of my background I'm from the south from Nabati in particular mm -hmm. my mom is from Jarjua a very nice village up the hill around Nabati closer to Jazin uh, maybe so I grew up there uh, I have two siblings two of which are both abroad, the mm. first in Boston and the second in Dubai. And I'm the only one here with my parents right now. Yeah. Uh, my background is mainly in media and political science. So I graduated a couple of years back from LU, uh, worked in media for a while, traditional media in Lebanon, uh, as a TV reporter for LBC that was during the uprising. Yes. I think many people recognize you from that stretch. Yeah, as well. Even though it was yeah. even though it was a short experience, it was right. roughly around eleven or twelve months, all yes. in all. It but it was like a peak time of TV exposure. Right. Yeah, because when we were all watching those split it, screens, exactly. that, that was, I think, my first memory of you, exactly. without knowing your name necessarily. Just that you were a recurring yeah. <laughs> figure yeah. on that period specifically. Yeah. So that was during the October Seventeen Revolution. Mm. So, in terms of my prior political stances. Uh, you know, ever since we've had this some sort of an alternative political narrative in the country, like bring on 2015 onwards, probably with the garbage crisis at the time and the movement, I kind of like took the political decision at the time, like something is wrong and something should be done. So I was kind of politically involved ever since, let's say, 2014, mm. 15 onwards. Of course, not, not as much as now, because the circumstances are different. Sure. You must have been quite young then. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm I was guessing. still I was still in high school. Right. But since then, I've I was already like sidelined with the let's say the third story or the third narrative at the time. If we want to look at things from like a binary perspective. So even in high school, you had that passion. Yeah. So may I interrupt you though? What what I mean? What is a high school student doing in the Ustink protests? Is it were you was this on your own initiative, or were you with friends that were there? And because I'm curious. If, that is a very uh, non-political age, if you will. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so I grew up in, th in the South, let's say, with kind of a couple of different narratives which are leading the scenario. Mm. And for some reason, I was always interested in history. So that's how it started. Like, I, I was really interested in history, in history class. I used to explain all the lessons to the rest of the class at times. And I was also interested in politics. Mm. So and then you see that the history book ends before everything that actually matters. So I kind of like plunged into all the details at the time from a very young age. I was really inspired at the time with uh, with Samir Asir in particular, right. with his writings uh, at the time specifically. And gradually I kind of explored a different narrative that was not very prevalent, if I may say, in the area or the community I was in. So you felt a bit like an outsider, even, yeah. even in high school, in that sense. In terms of political stances, yeah. Right. Like, yeah. Even in class, everyone used to remember that I used to pull all the political fights in high yes. school with everyone in class. But they're still very good friends, yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> even though. So I kind of had this always uh, alternative political narrative on what was happening. Hmm. And I always felt alone. But then, like, when the Youth Think movement started, I was like, no, I'm not alone. There's many people who are feeling the same way. Yeah. So I think many people felt that in October 17 as well, like a wider, a wider range of people. Right. But, like, if you really want to compare the 2015 and the 2019, uh, 
let's say, protests or uprising or revolution or whatever the terminology you want to use. Uh, I think the core kind of like the people who were really involved are very much the same people, like across the... From the Ustink era. Yeah, from, mostly, yeah. from the Ustink era to the October 17 yes. revolution. If it's not the same people, mm-hmm. but like the same kind of... Uh, we were talking about that bubble or yes. that echo chamber. Yeah. And I think what happened in 2019 is that, that that echo chamber was broken into something of a much wider scale. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of my educational background. Uh, then I got a job. So then I decided to move to the U.S. after working uh, in TV in Lebanon. Sorry, you lo- you moved to the U.S. for a very short time. It was that was in 2020 last yeah, year? Exactly. So I don't even, I didn't know that. I thought yeah. you were here the whole time. No, I I moved for a month or two. Oh, I see. So but very short. Yeah, it yeah. was. I took the decision to move hmm. for the purpose of getting a master's degree from the U.S. I see. I was accepted into a program, and I quit my job, and I decided to fly to the U.S. to study public policy at the time. I got accepted into the program. Which which university? It was University of Michigan. Okay. So, and then August 4 happened. That's Ann Arbor, right? Yeah, yeah, Ann Arbor. Oh, so you're there when August 4 happened. Yeah, I was there. And on August 6th, I was back here just down the street. Wow. So, uh, I felt like I'm, I cannot be outside of Beirut when all this fuss is happening. So I came back. So even before the program started, yeah. you were on your way back. So I did not start the program. Oh, that that's really incredible. Yeah. I took the choice at the time to stick for a while, see how things are going, humanitarian aid, uh, uh, and then also working with Mintishin at the time. So right. I kind of took the decision, like, I'm not going back to the U.S. And let's see how things flow. I, I think, uh, I mean, we're, we're different stories, you and me, but there's something very similar here. I think the fact that I couldn't come back on August 4 drove me insane. I was stuck abroad. Uh, I did come back eventually. It took me several months. But that feeling of... It's, Ann Arbor must be the most tranquil, calming, lakeside campus possible. That's how I imagine it. Exactly. Quiet, with a lot of students and that lifestyle. And then you're deliberately taking yourself back into a country that has fallen. Exactly. That is what storytellers do when they love that story. And this, in a way, it's, I didn't know it's that dramatic on your side. Yeah, yeah. Two and days I remember, later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and in terms of like storytelling, I remember that one time, you know, like uh, when that house collapsed and there was this Chilean team, they're looking for. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, and, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I remember at that time, like everyone was waiting to see if there is actually something or yes. someone or yeah. or a kid or anything inside. So, and they used to stop TV coverage at like twelve a.m. or one a.m. Yeah. yeah, I used to stay over with my cell phone like throughout that night just to like. I felt the need to actually be there, just waiting without even having like any actual duty or job. I know it's not central to the story, but I'm yeah. I'm curious. Did the university refund your tuition? I hadn't paid it back at the time. I had paid only the deposit. So. Okay, so you didn't lose yeah, no. your assets yeah. by... Okay, good. Because I think that would be also... That's very sad to spend that money and then yeah. find yourself here again. So here I am now uh, in Beirut pursuing a master's degree from AUB, even though I was accepted abroad. So... And with Mentishina at the time, I also have uh, my job. Al Arabi English, exactly. I'll say one more thing. Harib uh, Tammuz, July 2006. I was here, maybe similar to you. I had started a master's degree abroad at George Washington University in, in Washington, D.C. I was here during the Summer War, supposed to return. August, I stayed. And like you, did a master's degree at AUB. <laughs> so I'm 15 years behind you. Or if you're 15 years ahead, I don't know. But uh, mine was in Middle East Studies, which is very close to what you're doing in PSPA, I guess. PPIA. PPIA, right. Public Policy International Affairs. Right. So that's, I'm, I'm glad that there's this uh, similar, if you will, uh, trajectory. Uh, I will say, though, that you are more than a, let's say, just a journalist or 
maybe somebody who covers the news for an Arabia. Uh, and I don't think your master's degree is really giving you any credit because you are so politically charged and you're far more political than I was at your age. And I find that quite appealing. Um, you're very visible. And you're also, at times, um, I see you on the news. You're not shy of your activism. And I'm curious for you, from your side, is this almost a, I don't want to use the word calling, but do you see this as a natural component to that curiosity that you had when you were a bit younger? And I'll, I'll use his name in particular, Samir Asir, because he was an academic and a journalist and an activist. And an activist. And I think he's best known for his activism in his last months. But prior to that, I mean, the man is, uh, he's a lecturer, he's, uh, he's an author, and he's, he's a journalist. Yeah. Do you find yourself drawn to that story as well? I think so, very mm. much a lot. Like, uh, in particular with uh, Samir Asir and his writings and his interviews, like, uh, I think they inspired a lot of like my political narrative at the time, which obviously evolved over the years. Mm. Uh, also, with my decision to actually be involved in or study media in the first place. And then also the activism part comes a lot from that background as well. So yeah. I think... Uh, and I think Samir has left that impact on many people. Mm. And like even in the past two years, we've we've been hearing his name very much more often like yeah yeah so I I'm drawn to his story too the missing link in my piece of the puzzle is that I'm not a political uh, person if you yeah will. I'm not running for anything I don't I think I would feel so bad for anyone that hired me to do that <laughs> I would vote myself out but I do find my whole world revolving around his world too which is uh, the they Beirut part of storytelling. Absolutely. And uh, maybe writing, correcting a uh, false narrative and showing the, the beauty of the city in a way that's a bit unusual. And I think he mastered that craft. He's also a complicated individual, which I enjoy. A French citizen. And I think, I hope I remember this right, uh, a Palestinian father and a Syrian, Syrian mother. mother. But a Lebanese as well, citizen yeah. and uh, leftist. All the complexities of the Orient. Absolutely. And I mean, he's, I think he would, he would have described himself as liberal, if not an, just a leftist, yet he is part of the March 14 movement. So you have that, he, he showed the way forward, that you can be complicated, but you have a principle in mind. Exactly. And that's the principle I hold on to. And let's, you know what, let's go down this road. I, I like that you said that you're hearing his name today. And you're, I'm, I know what you mean by that, and that many times he's, he's referenced openly. And sometimes it's the same desires that are persistent. And at times, it's the same people. I mean, I'll go back to 2005. I've seen those protesters at October uh, 17 and, and beyond. But from your side, do you think it is the same story in the sense that what Samir Asir wanted is the core issue of what's wrong today? Or do you see it as an evolved story since 2005? And I'm not particularly referencing March 14 here, but I mean more that what he saw as the crux of the problem. Okay. And in going back a bit in time, I, it was more towards the Syrian regime. And I think, I hope I, I may butcher this quote, but Beirut will not blossom until Damascus, Damascus blossoms. flourishes or blossoms. Yeah. Right. And I think if you can expand on that, Hezbollah today is a reflection of that era, but it has obviously turned into something maybe in some ways bigger. So I'm, I'm curious if you think of it as one line or do you think of it as almost uh, different paths along the same road, but they're all going in the same direction? Uh, I definitely think it's 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 the same path. Let mm. alone how many people who consider themselves part of the March 14 Alliance at the time mm. or beyond that. I mean, like they were eventually the people who were part of that system initially. So right. I think like 
it was a very great momentum at the time that really took advantage of many factors, which no one could deny. Mm. But I think uh, there's a lot of people who are kind of now involved with everything that has happened over the past two years who kind of also look at that period with some sort of a very much of staying alert of how things should flow. Mm. Because in a sense, like the people who made that happen or who... Uh, progress the political narrative of that period were the ones who were sidelined eventually so right so right. that could be also uh, part of the conversation of why many people see this story mm. as kind of a standalone story right to avoid like having that also movement kind of hijacked all over again right but for me in terms of political narrative it is definitely the same line mm. and for me samir in particular and of course and many other people around him from this also kind of leftist school of thought yes. at the time, yeah. which is also kind of liberal, so maybe a social liberal school of thought, which I personally mm -hmm. affiliate myself much to. They saw the, the two parts of the story, like they saw the, mal the malfunction with the economic model that was there at the time, right. yeah. and all, they also saw the malfunction of the political uh, Syrian hegemon uh, hegemony or the proxy uh, or the Syrian uh, rule at the time, mm. uh, which is obviously now translated into an Iranian or Syrian or the Hezbollah influence in, in the country in yeah. particular. And for me, the fact that in 2019 in particular, we have our eyes wide open on a collapsing nation mm. for two reasons. For the economic model, which he had judged at the time. Right. And yep. for the political influence. So it's also. the same so story. It's, it's definitely the same story. Do you mind if we go into the economic side? Because that's the one I find most interesting when it comes to the debate today. Um, I remember, I'm going to go back a bit before his assassination, the build-up to what eventually became that whole wave of anti-Syrian uh, regime protest. That it was Samir Asir and Ziad Majid and other people in that camp that were very critical of Rafi Hadidi's economic uh, procedures under Syrian uh, hegemony. And they were very open in that debate, which I, I remember as being that healthy debate that you would want. Um, yet they were able to ally themselves for a common cause, which was trying to get the Syrian regime to leave Lebanon and other political actions as well, which included Hezbollah, but not that much back then in the way it is today. Do you sense that that conversation has died and that I, I get the feeling there's an absolutist policy today that you're either hell-bent on this uh, anti-Haririism or you're a traitor, and a traitor meaning that you're a regime supporter, your status quo. Yeah. And I, I don't believe that that exists. I actually see it in the way that it existed back then, except everything got worse. And I know it's a bit, it's, a, it's maybe a lazy, it's not a well-crafted question, but I'm thinking... I, I, of, got, I think I got the question. That I sense it's, there's a more, the line is, it, there's a divide that wasn't necessarily as divisive 15 years ago. Uh, definitely, and this is this brings me back to what I said a couple of minutes back when I mm. said like there's a lot of people who look at the mistakes of 2005 and they try as much as possible to not bring back a door for such mistakes in terms of mm. Uh, mm. you know like because all those people at the time it's possible who were in line with such a political narrative they had uh, their coalition or you know like the March 14 coalition with people are very much not the same uh, vision for, right. uh, for the country yeah. and look at the result back then. So they were all the ones who were sidelined. Mm. Uh, the future movement stayed obviously in power right. yeah. and then they started making all those deals with everyone else, mm -hmm. including Hezbollah, of course, yes. yeah. in terms of either political deals or economic deals or you know all, all the absolute corruption that we've, we've seen. So for me... I think this is quite uh, quite kind of something to put the light on. Like, uh, 
I really see see the vision in between. Like, there's this issue and there's this there is this issue, and they're interlinked in terms of like the economic model, which in lines also with all the corruption we've had, and mm. then there's uh, the hegemony. So right. there are two interlinked issues. So that is the. Th- that is the thread between what Samir Asir represented and today. Exactly. So the interlink. Do you think, and I'm asking you now, maybe it's putting you on the spot here, do you think that's how Mintashin finds itself as the continuation of those aspirations? And, and not being that uh, polarizing in the sense that you can't work with us if you're not 100% one flavor. Because I, I get the feeling that it is the, it is almost the, um, it is a 15-year process, but it's the, it's the same foundation of what Samir Asir left us with. And I hope I'm not saying that in yeah. too romantic of a way. But I do feel that this is a fairly left-wing, youth-driven, uh, cultured and intelligentsia-driven um, aspiration. And I don't think of any other group in that sort of world and I think of Mintashin in that in that lens. So you tell me if I'm wrong. Um, I think in particular there is probably a Samir Asir in many of the opposition movements. You know, like even if the whole vision is not still there, but there's obviously I think Samir has his effect on a very number of people who are still active and who mm. still mm. have hope in doing something for the nation. In Mintashin in particular, I think. Uh, so I personally found myself very much in Mintashim because of this kind of political narrative that sheds the light on both the hegemony and the corruption and uh, uh, all the lack of policy making over the past thirty years. So, and I think it's I think to there's say clarity, it's sovereignty too. Yeah, Samir Asir was not shy of that word. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, sovereignty, and I think there's clarity in the vision that Mintashim pre- is presenting. We are very clear on our sovereign position. We mm-hmm. are very clear on the corruption issues. And I think we are paving the way for uh, one of the possible, you know, like political parties that would be embedding a real social liberal uh, narrative for, mm. the, for the nation. Right. So, so in a way, it is fair to say that this is just a continuation. It could be in the general, in the general vision, if I may say. What I noticed more than March 14 and Samir Asir in particular is that Mintashin and many groups that have emerged are noticeably younger. That it's not the old guard that has found its way into these groups, it's the youth. And if there are older actors, they're, they're rebranded. Could be I mean, Pierre Aissa is one example of an unusually uh, age-wise, and I'm, I'm being a bit prejudiced here, his scooter aside, but I don't know of many other well-established, older figures that have been visibly at the forefront of October 17. And I think of the youth, and I think it is still referred to as a youth-led and youth-driven movement. Is there any appetite, and I know that this is maybe a bit premature because elections are not happening now, Maybe it is the question. To have that broader alliance the way March 14 worked, and the reason I'm asking it is I've already seen steps in that direction, whether it's these unified sort of ideas, and then you see the list of parties that have subscribed, and at times you see surprising names. You have disagreements at times over Kate'ib, whether they should be in or out, months of exhaustion on that issue alone. But I don't sense that there is much appetite to go into anywhere else and pull in what are referred to maybe as not necessarily the regime, but it's people that are not maybe as rushed into October 17th. Yeah. And I think this could be either parents, it could be many people we know that have not signed on fully to that aspiration. So. Do you think that, in a way, that doesn't matter, that it should be youth-led? Or is it more complicated than that, at least in your mind, and trying to make sure that this is not just one or two people that are voted in, that it's a number that is actually sizable and maybe can actually form an opposition in parliament? 
I think that's a very tough question for the period, especially with all the inter October seventeen kind of like dilemmas or yeah. or or questions. But for me, uh, it's definitely about having a clear vision this time. If there is agreement on a clear, let alone like you have all those internal conflicts between even this is not something we have to hide like the sure. differences between the. Uh, the new alternative political parties are not uh, are not very marginal, but there mm-hmm. are some differences. So, I think in any electoral campaign or in any coalition building, uh, there needs to be a very clear vision for the country. So, for me, uh, the vision is much more important than the broader election, the broader like coalition. If the broader coalition could be accomplished with a very clear set of uh, policies or a very clear political stance on all the issues, then let it be. If not, Mm. I personally would prefer a very clear political narrative for the people to actually vote for. So in other words, it's the principle over the pandering in that sense. You don't mind a smaller presence as long as that vision is clear. I respect that immensely. So you're not really there to just win votes. You're there to send a message. I'm asking you as somebody who's in Mentishin, but who's in also the uh, the details of the subject. I'm an observer, at best. You're a you're an activist as well. Um, do you think that this is a shared sentiment? And I mean it in the broadest sense, without having to go into those uh, that, those details that can be argumented uh, argumentative. That do you think this is a unifying principle, or do you think this is Mentishin? Sticking to its principles. no, uh, it's it's definitely like for example in Mintushin in particular, we are very open, as you just said a while ago, to have debates with everyone, to yeah. discuss everything with everyone. So we see ourselves, you know, like uh, in particular as part of the October seventeen movement as a start, which mm-hmm. is uh, the movement or of all those alternative opposition groups which were either there before or they were launched or yeah. kicked off after the October 17 uprising. So we definitely see those parties as our first allies or as our core allies. So, And then as you go wider, like the, the opposition is very wide. It starts with the, it starts with the Communist Party on one side and <laughs> ends with the Kateb on, on the other side. So it's true. Um, but I'm going to ask you here because I sense that that is an unresolved issue. It's definitely an unresolved. That shouldn't happen. Wait, hold on. <laughs> Where were we? <laughs> we were right there. We look good. I was into the nitty gritty of communism and kateibism. <laughs> And I sense that that, that's a real division. It hasn't been resolved. I mean, am I I right in saying that? Definitely. Okay, so do you think that that's a stumbling block, if you will, to that unified principle? I mean, uh, for me, it's really a matter of, as I said, you know, like having the clear vision. So if, for me personally speaking, and here I'm speaking on my personal own behalf, even not, uh, not Mentrine in particular, if we can get all the opposition movements and groups and the Thawra movements and uh, Kateib and Shuyua and all the ones in between to agree on one political program, a very clear political program uh, that has uh, very clear uh, positions in mm. terms of the economy, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of sovereignty, in terms of uh, the structure of the state we're looking to build over the next phase, then let it be. But if we can reach that point, which is also very possible, let's work on having the biggest number of actors on a unified program Mm -hmm. with those clear principles. I think that's the issue of our time, because I sense that this is something that has the 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 division on on that issue keeps growing as opposed to being resolved. But I, I share with I agree with what you're saying earlier that at the end of the day, it's the principle that matters, with or without a unified opposition. And I'm glad you guys are sticking to that. Um, I saw a photo of you a few months ago, maybe it's 
month and a half ago or so, when the um, the syndicate, the architecture and yeah. engineering syndicate, when there was a landslide victory for the opposition, and it's a photo, I think, you're holding Aline Flehan. Yeah. <laughs> so it's two people I know. <laughs> Aline's very happy. You're very happy. And I think all of us were happy. Uh, it was a major victory. And many people that many people that suffered personally were also showing that joy. Um, Paul Najad is one example. And it felt great. And this is perhaps the smallest of elections, but it's the first step. Taking us into national elections. Let's assume there's a, 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 a sizable victory where there's more people voted in than expected. And suddenly there's a small block. What that block does is, up, I mean, that's a hy hypothetical uh, question, but let's just assume that there's an opposition that's in parliament that's able to push for, for reform. My instinct tells me, and I could be fundamentally wrong, the same wall that happened in 2005 and 2009, meaning that you have an opposition victory, in those days a coalition, but there's a victory, destroyed, not through politics, not through debate, not through legislation, not even through persuasion, destroyed through violence. Uh, violence can come in the form of May 2008, which uh, takes us to what is, I think, a big tragedy for us, which is a forced national unity, which existed in 2008, thanks to Doha and friends, and came back to life in 2016. With the election of uh, Michel Aoun. And the, you said it best, everyone dancing with the devil and this unified position where they're all in the same bad camp together, whether it's future and, and the rest doesn't matter. They're all in national unity that, plun that plunges into where we are. That said, in 2009, it's a repeat victory for that March 14 coalition. They get nowhere in politics. May 2008 is violence, political assassinations, including Samir Asir, that's monthly, at times, monthly murder. I don't think the string of assassinations is necessarily going to pick up again only because the tools necessary to challenge our status quo are simply not here. I don't think there's a noticeable uh, security threat to Hezbollah, excluding Lukman Selim's assassination in February. But it's an important reminder that electoral wins are not wins in Lebanon. Yeah. And I, I, I hope this is not in any way like talking down to anyone trying to win in a, in a principled way. But I'll, correct me if you see it differently. I see it differently, but yeah. not uh, not in a way that I disagree with what you said. That mm. the sizable minority or a block in the like uh, in parliament is not going to specifically turn the table inside. Mm. But for me, how I see this as you have two main issues. One which is very instantaneous, which is the fact that we are in this unprecedented crisis, and for me, yeah. this political system altogether has collapsed. So mm -hmm. that's one thing. And then I see there is an issue of a political culture in the country on a very much more wider scale in terms of the decisions we've taken. Like, mm. all those people who were in... I mean, this is not Mubarak or Saddam who were ruling us. Those are people who got there with very much fair elections. Let it be a future movement, let it be Hezbollah, let it be Amal. All those people were elected into parliament. Yeah. You like the electoral law or you don't like it, they were voted in with votes of the people. That's true. So that's one thing. So you have two things that we're dealing with. Even if we're talking about all the hegemony and the Iranian influence and Hezbollah itself, and mm. I think we've talked about that in our walk, 
there are people who also voted for it. So yes, that's true. Not in all its details, possibly, or not knowing that they're taking this full package. But yeah. then there are people who voted for Hezbollah and for Amal. So right. So I, for how I see it is that you have two issues. One which is very much instantaneous: the fact that we are in this unprecedented economic and political crisis because even the institutions are no longer functioning. And you also have an issue of that we need political change over a longer period of time to actually be able to achieve real, uh, if I may say, results with turning the tables altogether. Mm -hmm. However, what I see is important about the next election, it's that it's a national consensus on what's happening. So, and here's the thing. Uh, the parliament for me is irrelevant as an institution mm. because I think the entire system has collapsed. And before we reach a discussion about moving on forward from this uncertainty, which has started on October 17, nothing is going to really happen. Like, I see uh, this country as it was frozen on the day of October 17, in particular in terms of all its institutions, and that we're not going anywhere forward before we discuss this entire system. So I believe that the discussion is going to happen. For me, having a sizable opposition uh, through legitimate election is giving you a higher or a bigger voice in any discussion that's going to happen, be it local, be it regional, mm. be it international. So for me, this is where I sense that, yes, the elections are important in terms of a national consensus to build a parliamentary bloc that would have a say in deciding the future of the country. So it's amplifying the voice for systematic change. Exactly. In the usual institution. Exactly. Even if that institution is not able to deliver the legislative change that people would like to see. Yeah. Let me challenge you on this. I carefully disagree. I've already, I've disagreed too much today on social media, so I'm going to <laughs> carefully disagree in person that the system is changeable. And I'll say this carefully because it sounds, I know how it sounds. It sounds like, what the hell is this guy talking about? Is he absent from everything? I don't think the very strange, odd, uh, inefficient power sharing thing that we live with and we've lived with for many years, I don't think that is changeable. And the reason I say that is because I just don't see any other reason for this country existing. Not to discredit everyone that wants to see it reformed, because I do think that reform is a noble goal. But the overhaul, or if you will, the um, a new social pact, or even the more charged uh, position of secular state, the way that maybe uh, resembles more like a European model. I just don't see that in the making. And I, the reason I emphasize this point is not because I'm 400 years old, I'm not an Ottoman, I'm not uh, a fan of French mandatory rule, and I don't particularly like groups to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> so all these things are, yeah. should point me in another direction. But that said, um, I don't think I don't think most Lebanese want to see the model change. I I think they want to see rampant corruption and and they want to see sectarianism refined, not taking us to hell. Me meaning that uh, things that have been discussed for years and years and years should finally be there like the Senate, which is this endless discussion. But in terms of radical, revolutionary regime change, I, I don't know if that's there. The, this, that doesn't nearly disagree with anything mm. that I've said before. Like, If I'm talking about kind of a regime change or, or a system change, that doesn't mean like toppling down the entire system that's, that's mm. already there. I see. Okay. For one reason that going back to the example that I gave, we're still in the democratic nation, mm. semi-democratic probably, in my opinion, uh, with some sort of a hidden police state, but that doesn't really matter at this point. So, 
or in the conversation. You're as bad as me. Yeah. Democratic, <laughs> but that, 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 that. I'm like, secular, but that, 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 that. It's the same thing. So, uh, my point is that this discussion on, possibly you called it reforms on the system. Hmm. For me, you know, like, if we go into a very much uh, reforming the system, for me, it's another social pact. And let alone that for me as well, I don't really like this coexistence story of the nation or this social pact of coexistence, because for me, we should not be coexisting as groups rather than coexisting as individuals. So this is why I would personally aim to have a new social pact that really respects us as citizens and mm. as mm. individuals rather than as parts of groups. And then even in such a social pact, you can still have uh, groups respected in one way or another. But right. then I believe that the base of the social back should be the individual and basic human uh, basic human rights and basic freedom for an individual with uh, with a social safety net or whatsoever. So and, that is and a decentralized state probably. Oh I see. So, so okay. So it's, so really it's a collective of like reforms that yeah. would lead into a new social uh, contract. And I see mm. that discussion on those reforms or happening sooner or later because the state itself and all its institutions and including all the state and non-state actors which are involved be it the opposition movements or the uh, traditional the the political parties yeah they all cannot function in what we have now so i see the change or the reform on the system inevitable can i but you could actually be moving into something that is worse if the discussion is open at any time. So mm. for me, going back to our topic, which was discussing the benefit of election. Yes. Yeah. For me, it's amplifying the voice of this sort of pressure on the reforms we need on the system in a way that would make the system better and not worse. So it's not that radical. Yeah. Okay. okay. I, I never said I'm for radical change. Is it fair to say that there's a big enough section of the opposition that does adhere to radical change and i know you're speaking on your behalf and i appreciate that but i th the reason i'm asking it now this way is that i don't know why it's so hard to get most lebanese on board with something that sounds very decent do you think that there's that inertia or those anxieties that in a way is why we have that model to begin with that there's this old hesitancy to not go down a road that's so unfamiliar in Lebanon because it should be a far more broader uh, whatever revolution uprising whatever you want to call it yet it seems over time that it gets smaller and smaller in terms of persuasion mm. and I say this as people that are on the streets 2019 late 2019 that are now not as supportive of that kind of change. So, I mean, is it a miscommunication? Or do you think that there are maybe some, maybe two extreme voices that do get unnecessarily amplified at times? Um, in particular, I think one, and this is also a comparison, like could relate to a comparison between like 2019 and 2005. Hmm. you had like this amplified political narrative that gradually was adopted over time before you reached 2005 while mm. in 2019 mm. it was more of a really a social chaos and then you started yeah. developing the political narrative right so yes in the momentum of october 17 i think everyone at the time was aiming for super radical change Right. But then moving on forward and looking at all the dynamics and then you have all these groups and all those political parties that are uh, showing up on the screen, if I may say, yeah. that's when the political narrative starts developing gradually. So, I mean, when, when we discussed the political narrative of Mentashin in particular, we discussed it in a very visionary way, if I may say, like how would we want to aspire this nation to be? And then we looked at the... Uh, the realist kind of approach as well. Right. And we kind of brought those together in a sense of this is why me personally, I would be saying like 
there are a set of reforms that could happen to this existing system mm -hmm. that would take you closer to what you aspire your perfect nation would be. Right. Then there are other people on the other side who are really radical in their in their in their thought or vision, and they have every right to be as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think both voices do exist, like everywhere and in every other topic you open. So right. So maybe Mintashin is that bridge because I think it is at times it is amplified in a radical way, and at times it's measured in a healthy way. And I see Mintashin as really that uh, that very attractive part of a much larger opposition. Maybe I'm being too kind to Mr. Shreem, <laughs> but I, I really mean this, and I, I'll, I'll go back to what I said at the beginning. Uh, I had a maybe two-hour discussion, maybe a little less, with uh, Hussein in uh, SIP in Jamaisi, born out of a disagreement on Twitter. We decided to flush it out in person. It's the best exchange I've had. And I think we learn from each other and that we kind of understand that these disagreements are not as big, or if you will, they're not as... Uh, social media is not the place to... To discuss. Him, even though both of us, I think, have a bad habit. Me and more than him. <laughs> so I appreciate the exchange. Sam and Makerim is someone else that I've had that... There's an intellectual curiosity over everything. And uh, I don't know of any other group that has that the passion and the, the thought and the drive and the no fear, if you will, to tackle every single issue. That includes Hezbollah, which I think was unfortunately too controversial in maybe the first year following October 2019. I think it only became something that you can openly discuss after the August 4 blast and really towards the end of last year. There we Shit. go. Darkness. So hopefully it comes back. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> the good news is we're still recording, but uh, Jad Ghassan, if you've watched his episodes yeah. recently, he does them in the dark. We can continue. Let's continue. It'll eventually come back. Yeah. And if it doesn't. And we can finish the episode on darkness. That's Beirut for you. And look at us. We have those, those blue lights. Ahamshi audio is still working. We can we can keep going. Let's it's, keep it's, going. Yeah, this is Beirut. Lano, right. there's chance it's not coming back. So you're absolutely right. Done. It'll surprise us at yeah. the end. I uh, I think that is the <laughs> that is the issue that maybe is what caused electricity to go out. I say Hezbollah <laughs> too many times. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, not only are we watching you, we know where you live, and you know <laughs> this punishment. Yeah. Damn it. It took too long, in my opinion, for this to become something that's out in the open. And I think maybe the reasons are reasonable. There are a lot of people that don't want to put their lives at risk for saying something that could put them in, in some jeopardy. Or they don't want to get intimidated, social media and in real life. But it is now out in the open. And Mintashtin does have a very serious position on militia which I think is still maybe absent in every single opposition group, but it is finally out in the open regardless. Do you think at this critical juncture that we're all going through, whether it's institutions that are failing, whether it's uh, something that's unnecessary, a port blast that destroys half the city, something that we shouldn't pay a price for, we're in a war zone still in 2021, and we're still paying that price, and there's no need for it. Do you think that Hezbollah is that critical obstacle, or do you see it in a more measured way, that you can still make progress while this issue remains unresolved? Because I think that is the question that remains. It's not been answered properly. And I think there's a variety of opinions here. But in my sense, I don't see progress with this issue left unresolved. Even when the reasons for it being unresolved are real. But maybe the answers are not in Lebanon. Nonetheless, I can't imagine reform or uh, politics functioning as long as we're a war zone. And I really think that is what we are at the moment. 
So in this very dark and intimate war zone. Yeah. You tell me if you think differently. And I would appreciate it, really, in a, in a way that you, the way you see it. We, we flirted around this subject when we met in person. Yeah. But I think this is a better way to, uh, to air it out. And please tell me if you see it radically different. I don't see it radically different, but it's possibly like I don't see it as the... I mean, uh, there is a very big chance that, one, discussing Hezbollah and its weaponry needs, uh, needs Hezbollah to be ready for them to actually discuss it as a start because for one simple reason that they can take hostage of the entire nation part of which many would say they already have or it's already in process. So uh, to the past two years, I think they have uh, taught us many lessons in regards to Hezbollah. Like if Hezbollah wasn't there and wasn't the main player in power, the system would have totally collapsed on October 17. Yeah. Uh, Hezbollah was and its allies and by its allies it's obviously Hezbollah uh, they had the first government formed Hassan Diab's government woohoo so Hassan Diab brings it back don't say Has- <laughs> <laughs> it's still there Hassan Diab so they formed the first government <laughs> afterwards uh, they're the decision makers uh, and Obviously, their involvement with the nitrates uh, could sort of be verified either with all the reports we've saw before uh, in terms of who brought the nitrates in, uh, which businessmen brought the nitrates in, to who those businessmen are close. There's obviously some sort of a link to Syria and, uh, and Hezbollah as well. And all the other nitrates that were actually... Uh, found in Cyprus and other parts of the world that did also belong to Hezbollah. So there's a big a chunk of the issue that is obviously Hezbollah yeah. and all the other traditional political parties which either have paved the way for Hezbollah to reach this much power or have uh, been involved in all this scandalous corruption uh, over not discussing Hezbollah in the first place. So... Uh, but, but in Mintashin, in running for elections and being politically active and forming a party, do you think the, min- the goals you've set out, or you, not you, but Mintashin sets out, are achievable with that issue left unresolved? No, this is what I said in particular, that I see the next period as a period of uncertainty mm. that would not be over even if election were done, mm. before mm. we all sit on a table and decide how are we moving forward with this nation. That definitely includes the issue of Hezbollah, the national defense strategy, the uh, the you know like the foreign strategy. Mm. So that in particular is also part of this whole discussion. Right. So for me, Hezbollah is part of all this institutional uncertainty. So they go in hand. We have this uncertainty of a system that for me has collapsed and we cannot move forward. And we also have that uncertainty of how are we going to move forward with this in this nation with all those issues. So for me, even yeah. if elections happened and a political bloc was formed and a new parliament was formed, for me, that's all irrelevant because I see this as part of a political uncertainty in the country that will not be resolved before we sit on the table and discuss it all together with Hezbollah on the table, with, let be, is it a local discussion, or is mm-hmm. it a regional discussion, is it an international discussion, is it linked to the JCPOA or not, that's something else. But for me, I see that the discussion is inevitable. That's interesting. So in a way, you're acknowledging also that it may not be our discussion at the end. May, definitely. I appreciate Out that. of political reality. Yeah, I appreciate that. So there's no, you don't paint a rosy picture in that sense. I'm glad. I'm glad you're saying this, that... The discussion has to happen, even if it's, even if we're unable to have that discussion, because I think we tried in different ways to have that discussion here, and we've proven multiple times that there's no discussion. Even when you had things like the Bab the Declaration nine years ago, which was just signed and then ignored a second or two later, 
that's national unity. Uh, that's defense strategy. Sorry. So I, I appreciate that acknowledgement, and that I also like that you're saying it's really just to amplify rather than to expect fundamental change anytime soon. You're young. I understood from you that you're not leaving this country anytime soon. And uh, you're, I hope you don't mind me including this in the episode. Uh, you're also perhaps thinking about owning a small business. I can, I can leave it uh, yeah. <laughs> blank. Yeah. But you're thinking about opening a small business at a time that the country's in chaos, economic collapse. I appreciate this passion that you have, and I really think that this is what's needed at this critical juncture. That said, almost everyone I know in a friendship capacity, good friends, old friends, they're in Istanbul, they're in Cyprus, or they're further away, Dubai, or Europe, America, so on. And I find myself increasingly looking for, you know, new friends. And I'm 40. <laughs> it's not easy to make new friends at 40. But you're forced to sometimes, and I, I do this here. I see us as maybe um, we're in a minority camp where you, it can get a lot worse. And I'm going to bet you're still here. I know I'm still here, and I can see this at some point. We're in Tenurin looking down. It's sort of volcanoes and dragons are flying. <laughs> and we're like, what the hell are we doing here? We're still here. <laughs> so I, I could see yeah. a nightmare scenario getting worse. And I still will be here. And I think you will too. I mean, no one comes back two days after the August 4 blast, throws away a master's degree opportunity in the University of Michigan, unless their heart is here. And I know that your heart is here. But the noticeable decline in... I think people that are politically passionate is... Or insane. increase. You think it's increased? I think definitely it's increased. The passion? The number of people who are politically involved... Has gone up. Has gone up. Oh. Even with the number... Even in compared to the number of people leaving. Really? Oh, that's... Okay. So you see it as a net positive in that yeah. sense. Can you elaborate on this? Because I, I say it as people that I associate from... You stink and also March 14 or 2005, that they're gone. Yeah, but I think, and here's also the bet, possibly, or if I may say the reasoning. A lot of people have left, a lot of people who were politically involved, but then there's a lot of people who are stuck here, and a lot of people who cannot leave, or may not have the luxury to leave. Yeah. And those are people who are also turning away uh, from their realities into political parties or adopting political narratives and being more politically involved. So I think it is possible that many of the faces that we have seen over the past decades are leaving and moving out of Beirut into Dubai or Istanbul or any other city. But there's also a generation that is getting more involved into politics and a mm -hmm. generation mm -hmm. that may not all have the opportunity to actually secure a ticket and a job or a residency and leave. So, right. I mean, like, even leaving, I mean, for some people it could be easy. Those who have passports, those who have money abroad, those who do get a scholarship abroad. But mm. for the vast majority of people, and in a very realistic manner, leaving is not an easy option. I agree with you on that, but I meant more in the reformist-minded people that maybe I'm thinking limited, limitedly in that a lot of the civil society crowd that I know has gone. Those that have a maybe a intimate knowledge on what politics yeah. is in this country for many years, they've packed up, they've, they've let go. But I'm, I'm glad you're saying this. You see it as... I, th I see the net as positive, you know, mm. like, yes, there are a lot of people who gave to the political narrative, who were part of the movement. And I think their efforts are still there. Like, yeah. And this is, this is kind of a cumulative political path. So some people may, you know, like have their voice up at times. Uh, sometimes they lose hope. They go yeah. away for a few years. But the narrative is still there and it's moving. And there's more people kind of adopting it, I'd say. 
So for me, the net is positive. Like the number of people who are involved now with all the alternative groups, it's not a small number of people who are who are active. Like if, for example, let's take Mintushreen. Yeah. If you have at least 200 people who are fully dedicated and fully active, fully active and who are ready to give their time and who are working yeah. on doing some sort of a change, compare that to any other traditional party, Hezbollah on the side because it's a different scenario. Yeah. It's compared to the future movement or Amal or... Uh, or, or any of the... Or, even Kate, or no, Kate, even I don't think that... Uh, I'll, any of the yeah. yeah traditional parties how many active like actual members who are dedicated to to do the work in between like regional coordinators and uh, sector coordinators and whatsoever that's a fair point i You're don't right. think the number is more more higher than than 800 or 700 at a best case scenario for those parties yeah. so that's true looking one year uh, two years back when mentishin did not exist and looking now at a growing number of uh, people and of uh, youth and who are joining and who are actually joining in a very active manner, mm. I think the net is positive. And this is not just a machine. I think in every other opposition group, it is also the case. I appreciate that sentiment. I wouldn't have seen it that way actually before. But I think when you list the numbers in, in a sort of a, it's almost like a, in an accounting way, you're right. There is a political... You don't need 20,000 uh, people who join your party to make a change. I think, you know, I agree. But I meant more that people that have tried in the past that are yeah. not trying this time. For reasons that probably are legitimate. And that you would want that crowd to be involved. Otherwise, you're simply starting over and over and over. And this time it feels like that. I don't think you're starting over. I think mm. you're just adding up to something that's already there. That's how I yeah, see it. Yeah. So even if I see tens of people who were politically active at times and they decided to leave, mm. I don't see it as starting from scratch. I see it as adding on top of all the efforts they have made at times. I think it's well said. Usually I would wrap it up with that kind of positive note because that is a positive note, but I'm going to throw a negative one in just to <laughs> again? end it. Yeah, maybe it'll go off again if I say his name. No. I, I think I stood up and said yes when you were saying something focused in Serde, which I don't know if many people have said this. They probably have. It got traction online. You were asked, and forgive me for not remembering it 100% now, but something along the lines of, is everyone corrupt at the same level? Or is, can you say that every party shares the same burden. And you found a way to explain it that was so reasonable and so straightforward. I'm like, that's it. That, that's it. And I'll, I'll, one thing in particular, you said, you were, uh, the question came up regarding the Lebanese forces. And if I remember this right, you're saying they're not, if you think about corruption and focusing in only on corruption, they're not as corrupt as other groups in the current lineup in the establishment. I was bashed for that statement, by the way. <laughs> so <Sorry. You, laughs> I should look at the camera. I'm looking away the wrong side. You were bashed, and then here you have this idiot. He's <laughs> like, Ask yes! me a question again. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Repeat. Do that again. For me, it was a fantastic moment of clarity. And I really, at that moment, I was like, I want, one day I hope to meet him. And it's, it's nice that a few months later I meet you. But uh, thank you for doing that first. Second. Is it so hard to do this in the opposition or even in Mintishrin, where you have to stick to fact as opposed to this endless balancing of... They're as bad as the rest. Hezbollah is the same as future movement. Hariri... Hassan Nasrallah, Samir Jaja, Sami Jmeir, Nabih Birri, blah, blah, blah. For me, for me, I think at this point, I do agree with part of all of this radical rhetoric that they're all bad. Because for me, they're all interlinked somehow. And they all have sort of had a hand in 
everything that we've reached. Yes. But then if I look at the problem, I personally wouldn't mind digesting it or looking at a micro or a, or a nano level on where everyone should be held accountable. Like, it is very obvious that not each and every party has benefited out of corruption as much as the other. Mm. It is also obvious that not each and every party uh, also... Uh, was a reason of why we are now uh, a pro-Iranian nation. So yeah. they're all involved somehow in this whole chaos. I would have used a different word right now that's really on my mind. I just don't want to say, say it. Say it, please, please. No. I can edit it later. <laughs> it's really just an orgy of all those parties. Oh, I've had to be nice with that one. <laughs> well, I'll ask you afterwards if I can keep that in because that's pretty good. Yeah, so <laughs> all those parties were embedded together i've never been to any orgy where these crowds show up but i've never been to an orgy yeah so <laughs> let's hope no employer or ambassador is watching this episode right now with the term and they're, anyways it's, while, it's while they're at the orgy they're yeah <laughs> so but not everyone is as involved as as the other in the orgy itself <laughs> right that's a very good and graphic explanation. So the orgy is defined by a few actors that have made it possible to have the orgy. Then you have the smaller figures, yeah. <laughs> smaller figures that have contributed less to the yeah. party. I mean, even the parties we don't agree with, let's say Slim Infanji or the SSMP, the Syrian Socialist Nationalist Party or Vekateev, for example. I mean, they're really irrelevant to the entire debate. In terms of size. Yeah. Just forget the orgy analysis. Yeah. Now. Just in terms of uh, <laughs> numbers. In terms of numbers. Yeah. And vis-a-vis -vis responsibility. Right. Right. I see. So it's really a matter of magnitude, not necessarily the... Uh, it's a, you can be unprincipled yeah. or you can have bad intentions. Exactly. Say, but, but your contribution is less. Yeah, exactly. I will, I'd agree with you there, but I think what I understood from the nuance you offered is that there are some parties that implicitly are less corrupt, and there are some parties that are implicitly less violent, or yeah. for that matter, some parties that have had less of a footprint in the last 30 years. Yeah, I mean, even look at Michel Aoun, for example, or yeah. the future, the, F, uh, the FPM. Yeah. Like, look at the phase possibly before 2000. 11, if I may say, when... Yes, yeah. Like, between 2005 and 2011, yeah. if we're if everything had happened back at, in 2011, if we were having the same conversation yeah. in 2011, I would have said absolutely the same thing on FPM. Right. You know, in terms of corruption, if yes. I may say. yeah. But now... And this is where I come to digest, to, like, dissect each and every puzzle out of the game to actually have each and every party or actor blamed for the mistakes they did right. in us getting here so and if we like if we're looking at the mistake out of two issues one is economy and policy making decisions that were taken and corruption and then like the whole issue of foreign policy and yeah. the and, and the hegemony and Hezbollah on yes. another hand, so I'm looking at those two issues. Hmm. Each and every party has played some sort of a role in either or. Right, right. I think that's a fair way of describing it. I think it's also fair to suggest that uh, over time, you end up with a more pro-Hezbollah situation by default, and that politics, the way we would like to see it happen, ends with assassination, at least in the last 15, 16 years, but it's been going on much earlier than that with the Syrian involvement. And as unfortunately, impunity is part of our uh, post-independence uh, or even pre-independence, but that it took a different role in killing aspirations in the last 16 years. I'll take that earlier question one step further, and I won't take more of your time. Uh, do you think it's still uh, up for debate in terms of having the Lebanese forces in the opposition? Not the opposition, self-proclaimed opposition. I mean, 
welcomed the way that some groups have welcomed Kate'ev? I don't think so. Okay. May I don't, I'm not so well versed in this issue, but, but could you explain it? And I think the comparison is also very much about the, the narrative, the political narrative. Mm. So, yes, the Kateb and the Lebanese forces may be very similar in their past, but looking on at the political narrative they're holding, uh, it's very different. Mm. So, let's assume a very radical October 17 supporter is discussing and does not like Kateb and does not like the fact that some groups are in communication with Kateb. Right. Bring which, him which on a table. A big, there's a big number. Yeah. 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 Bring him on a table yeah. with someone from the Kateb or a Kateb supporter, and I think they can pull out a conversation mm. where they reach uh, some sort of an understanding or a common vision. Mm. I don't think that is possible with the Lebanese forces. I see. And this could be much of a bigger issue. For the Lebanese forces themselves, mm. because I don't see it as an issue of uh, agreeing with, you know, like the the MPs or you know, like the political party members, rather than an issue of agreeing with this base that supports the Lebanese forces. Right. So. Right. Yeah, and I think you can translate it into that way. Is it something to do with? It's so so sorry. It's less to do with their civil war. History, it's more to do with their current... With their current narrative. Right. Yeah, which yeah. could also fall back in line with some... With the remnants of the civil war, you know, like... Yes, you may agree on many issues a parliament member who belongs to the Lebanese forces bloc is mm. talking about. Because mm. they do have some good MPs, if, mm. if you're comparing to the rest. But then have a conversation with someone who supports the Lebanese forces and who's not who does not really have any sort of uh, a role in the party out of like the mass that is considered a Lebanese forces mass. Right. You have a real issue of a different political narrative that's there. May I ask what is that issue? And I, cause I, I really, mean I think it. it's a different vision, a different mm -hmm. vision for the country, a different, uh, a different rhetoric to things, a different political narrative. Right. So I'm not sure if I really elaborated on the issue well, but I think you could, you could, Kind but of take it forward no, from there. I'll hypothesize here. Is it simply a word, the word sectarian? That it's a more sectarian-like party? Yeah, it's but it, it's not just it's it's not just about sectarianism itself. Mm. It's mm. about you know like having. I see the Kata, the Kata base as possibly a closer in terms of a vision and narrative for the nation than the Lebanese forces base. Mm. 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 If that translates right. That's interesting though. I like that, that dichotomy that you're describing, that an MP could be in line, but the voter could yeah. be out of step with the Yeah, they could be a very sectarian voter who would want to just close down any Rumeni or Pshari or, or and just have coffee with his Maronite community. And the Kate'ib, from your experience at least, is has tried to make that effort to step away from that. Yeah, and I think the effort to step away from that is easier from their side because right. they're definitely a smaller party, definitely. That's interesting. This in this very interesting dynamic. So they and they're also technically not in the not in not in not in bed anymore. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And even though like I think the Lebanese forces have tried so much over the past two years to kind of get away from that bed that we've talked about. Yeah. But all in all, it's it's very it's not possible for them. Right. They, they cannot take this entire dissociation from the system because they're just, for me they're part of it. They're very much part of it. Mm. I think that's a subject in itself. Yeah. And I'm glad you were even willing to discuss it a bit because it's something that I think about often, and I, I, I appreciate the way you're you're describing it in almost. Um, I don't want to say scientific. Yeah, yeah, you're making it easy to, to see it as sort of uh, trying but not getting as far as it needs to and perhaps the reasons why other parties can do it easier. So I, I appreciate that. I've taken more of your time than we agreed to, but I'll say this. Uh, I really admire Mintashreen, and I have said this in different ways earlier. 
Uh, I think if there is a future political movement in the making that is politics driven and parliament and otherwise, amplifying a voice otherwise, um, I think you guys are very good at what you're doing and you're persuasive. So I respect you, respect your dreams, they, they reflect my own, and I also really, really respect the discussions that I've had on the record, off the record, and I look forward to having more. So for the first English podcast episode that you've done... <laughs> I think also, it went well. I think so too. And we had, what, just 10 minutes less of no electricity? Less probably. Less one subject, yeah. no electricity. The rest, Hassan Diab. <laughs> That's the gift of Kahraba. So thank you, Rawat. Thank you, Roni. And I really enjoyed it as well. And I think uh, we probably need a couple of more hours <laughs> To tackle everything else. <laughs> well, I'm glad. No, <laughs> let's leave it for another time. Yeah, exactly. For another time, we'll be here until five in the morning. Yeah. Thank you. Definitely Allah. for another time. Thank you. Thanks for listening and watching, and a friendly reminder to support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah. And this is the Beirut Banyan.